I'm so grateful they decided to join us on this, the second Tuesday in the season of Advent. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your many blessings and for this opportunity and privilege to prepare ourselves for meeting you anew this Christmas season. So we ask you to continue to inspire us with your presence, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I've already given you the name of today. It's the second Tuesday in the season of Advent. And, oh, notice on our screen back here, there are two candles lit. You may not be able to see because it's more one-dimensional here on the table for you. There are actually two candles lit here on the altar. Uh, but you notice the orientation of my lighting is a little bit different. I lit the first candle on the left-hand side and then the candle behind it differently what they do on the picture. It shows up better on the picture that way, and that's probably why they do it. But it is a tradition that in many liturgical congregations, you light the low, lower left candle first, and then the upper left candle, and then you continue to work clockwise. Hmm, you see how that happens? You work clockwise around the uh, Advent candle until you get down here, and then ultimately the, uh, the Christmas candle. So that's a tradition, by the way. You might remember if you joined us last week that... These are relatively new traditions in the church. I mean, it's only been 50 years or so that the church has been using Advent wreaths and Advent candles. And I know you probably think, what? this has been years and years and years and decades. Well, no, it hasn't been. It's only been 50 years. <coughs> the Advent wreath is a new phenomenon. In fact, it's so new that we don't even have an agreed upon definition of what these candles mean. We don't. Maybe your church does. Maybe our church does. Our congregation uses different names for these candles. But as a world, we don't have different names for them. What's interesting, what I do find interesting about this, is that this tradition, this new novelty of these Advent candles, is much different than it is for the candles that we have during the season of Lent. We have candles during Lent as well, too, don't we, that we light? But we don't name all the candles. Uh, it's just interesting that we've named the candles and found ways to do it. What we're going to do is we're going to share some of the options that people use for names and the different traditions that are starting to develop about the Advent wreath, and we're going to read some scripture here today. But there are two different traditions that I would like to highlight. One, I'm going to first of all point out the one that we use, and we'll, the word peace. So last week, we said the first candle was a candle of hope. Today is a candle of peace. Okay? So you will notice that there is a difference between the names that I'm giving them in terms of the actors who are doing them. Last week again was hope. Um, this week, there is also a tradition of repentance. Uh, now, there's, there's this, I get it, and there are a lot of churches that call the second candle repentance. I'm okay with that. Go do that. Uh, we don't typically label it as that. We name it the label of peace. And I'll tell you, there's a big difference between the word peace and the word repentance. The word repentance, just like last week, is an action that I do. Peace is something that God gives me. In the same way, hope is something that God gives me. So that's why I think in my tradition, we are really emphasizing words that are not my activity and what I do in preparation for Advent, although preparation for Advent is important, but it's what God is bringing to me in Jesus Christ. And that is why, is there anything wrong with using the word repentance to describe today's lesson and today's uh, uh, theme? No. In fact, if you listen to the gospel lesson appointed for the second Sunday in Advent, that lesson is about repentance. John the Baptist, it comes from the gospel about John the Baptist calling people to repent. So there's good, solid reason why repentance might be used as a theme for the candle or as a label for the candle. But if the candles represent something uh, luminous, something 
bigger than, something in that space between heaven and earth, something that God brings to us. I kind of like this tradition a little bit better. So let me read to you the appointed Old Testament lesson, one of the appointed Old Testament lessons for today. And again, that changes year to year because we have a three-year cycle called, uh, uh, the, the, the three-year cycle uh, that we use um, for reading the scriptures, okay? One first year uh, of, uh, of a lectionary emphasizes the Gospel of Matthew, and then it has Old Testament lessons and epistle lessons that kind of go with it. Second year is Mark, and third year is uh, uh, Luke. <laughs> John, you're going to say, where does John come in? Well, John gets interspersed throughout the seasons and throughout the three years. So uh, John kind of supplements the gospel readings that we do. But I want you to hear from the book of Isaiah about peace. So again, I'm okay if you want to label today's candle repentance. You're in good standing. Many churches do. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just a new tradition. But I like peace because, again, it's a reminder that this season is something that we're anticipating something that God is bringing into our life. It's not something I do. It's not my repentance that brings peace. It's God's forgiveness that brings me peace. I need to repent, but I repent because God has forgiven me. God doesn't forgive me because I repent. Oh, I want to say that again. God forgives me, therefore I repent. I don't repent so that God forgives me. Peace comes from God's forgiveness. We like to always emphasize the activity of God. So let me read to you from Isaiah. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. Okay, imagine for a minute. You've got a stump. It's dead. No life has been seen in this stump for years and years and years. It's an image. Stump of Jesse, that's kind of a description of Israel. Okay, it's a, there, there, there was a fellow named Jesse. Okay, and uh, um, this was a phrase that was used uh, for referencing the nation of Israel. A shoot of Jesse from the stump. A branch will grow out of its roots, out of his roots. So in other words, it's coming from this dead stump. So who's the one that makes this peace come? God does. It's not a repentance that makes God come. It's just God's activity. It's something that in this dead thing that nobody saw any life in, God brings it. Okay? The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now, when Isaiah was prophesying this, he was probably thinking very tangibly in terms of somebody who is standing right there in front of him. The promise of a king, maybe Hezekiah. Not realizing that this prophecy would truly be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's amazing how the Bible works, okay? So he goes on. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Oh my! He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked, okay? God is always, by the way, on the side of the poor, always on the side of the poor. If you take your stand against the poor, you are taking your stand against God. And there will be a consequence to that, the prophet says. He goes on. But this is very hopeful <laughs> and very peaceful to those who are poor, who recognize that God is on their side. It goes on. Righteousness shall be his belt around his waist, faithfulness a belt around his loins. 
that's kind of a very typical image. You might remember in, uh, Paul talking about uh, clothing yourselves in preparation. You know, the preparing yourself and the different clothing that he mentioned that we should prepare ourselves and how we're to gird our loins and the breastplate we're supposed to put on. Kind of a similar type of thing. He's probably reflecting upon this. The wolf shall live with the lamb. What? The lamb's not going to be afraid? Wow. The leopard shall lie down with a kid. Are you kidding me? They're not going to eat them? No. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, a child... A child shall lead them, shall not be threatened. There will be peace. The cow and the bear shall graze together, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, the wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. By the way, please don't try that. There's a crazy group of so-called Christians, a cult-like group that actually plays with poisonous snakes and uh, get bitten on occasion, die because they're stupid. Okay? We're not at this time. Alright? This is not that time. But we have a time where there will be peace. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples of the nations, shall inquire of him, and his dwelling place shall be glorious. There will finally be peace. So last week we looked at hope, hope of one day this would come. Today, the peace that will be brought because of the activity of God through, wait a minute, wait for it, wait for it, through who? Peace is brought through who again? Dang, you all are so good. It's that Sunday school answer, isn't it? It's just like it's Sunday school. You know, I remember being in Sunday school and uh, the teacher would always ask a question. If you said Jesus, you were almost always right. And if you weren't right, you still got a good gold star <laughs> because it was close. And you know, Jesus is always the answer. The reason for the peace in our hearts, the reason for the peace that God is going to bring into this world is because of what Jesus is going to do. Let's give thanks in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for the gift of peace that is beginning in our hearts through the gift of Jesus Christ, but we know that's not enough. That peace is meant to go into the world, but sometimes the peace that we bring into the world gets met with violence. And so we're praying that you would transform and touch the hearts of those who are not governed by your peace. Continue to work your peace in this world. Through Jesus Christ we ask. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.